Oh yeah, thank you. Well, thank you for organizing this. This is such like a, a gem and a and a hard time. This is a very very awesome idea. So, can you guys see my screen and everything? Okay, so the only problem I have is that sometimes I will scroll my screen and it won't start scrolling on the on the main one. So if I'm talking and then it doesn't make sense, just let me know and I'll try to. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, this is called vertex distortion of lattice knots. And I guess I should provide a little background because hopefully this doesn't make sense at all. So I went to a liberal arts school, which I loved, but uh, it was low on resources for grad, grad classes. So the topology I had, you know, didn't have any algebra or any analysis to help me along. So I tried to come up with an idea or something fun that you can do that didn't require much machinery. And this is that. So my name is Nicholas. And I worked with uh, a professor at San Jose State, Marion Campisi. Okay. And I assume most everyone here knows what a knot is and all that, but I, because this is recorded, I'd like to just start from the beginning and make sure that everyone, you know, if you haven't seen a symbol or something that, you, you know, we're all on the same page. So the technical definition is that a knot is an embedding of S1 into S3. Typically, you think of these as being smooth. Now, I think being such a vast field, it's kind of a it's kind of a quaint little definition, so few words. But really, what you're looking at is a closed curve in uh, in R3 that doesn't intersect itself, and I get to play around and move things. And I'd like to, the big question is, you know, when when are these equal? So these three are unequal if I have these in my hand and I get to push things around. Um, if you're unfamiliar with S3, you know, I I think when you Google knot, you probably will come up with something like a you know a sailor's knot, you know, something that looks like this. So clearly that's not a knot, but it'll it'll just be like a a line like this, and it has two ends. Well, if I think of this as being closed in a ball, um, and then once I touch the edge of it, I'm gonna consider those to be the same point. So really this S3 definition is probably the one that you think of um, if you haven't seen this before, because once I hit the edge here and the edge here, I, I close it up and I get something that's um, a loop opposed to just something that like you tie your shoes and you have the ends. Okay, so everyone knows what it knot is. Isotopy, so I'm gonna, I guess just to save time, if I were to give you this a piece of string and uh, in the real world, the laws of physics, uh, you're allowed to push things around, you can't cut it. And that's essentially what the ambient isotopy is going to keep track of. You actually can't say, if you do know some of these terms, you can't say it's just an isotopy because you can. Um, it's kind of weird, but you can you can create a knot and you can shrink it down. And technically, shrinking uh, a tangle down to a point um, is okay if it's an isotopy. But the ambience means that I'm I'm actually adjusting the space around it, and that translates to uh, not violating any laws of physics if I had these things in in real space. And that kind of speaks to why why I study these things. Oh, okay, if you haven't seen a Reitermeister move, if if I'm allowed these three moves, this is all I need to do if I give a planar diagram. Okay, I see a lot of shaking heads. People know what this is. Uh, I'm mainly, if someone would like to come watch this video later, it's for them. So take a look at these. I only need to do these three moves to, to somehow describe this complicated ambient isotopy, which is a very uh, fundamental idea. But the reason why to study these and uh, I'm giving you all these terms is this, this uh, the problem that I'm going to talk about actually has an application to, it has an application to biology because certain DNA forms a loop. So if you've seen, if you took, I think I took AP bio and bacterial DNA is, is exactly this, it forms a loop and you like to know where does it cut itself and so forth. So these, these things are, are studied there. The problem I was told is that it's not nice like this diagram. It's more like you get a, a plate of spaghetti and it's just all full and you say, what knot is this? And it's very hard to tell which knot it is. So we have to come up with some type of an, an invariant that is going to be able to do this. So low, low crossing knots are not as bad. So 
those rules I showed you above, that's what's happening here. So each one of these we'll call a, a diagram, or I guess I had been calling them confirmations, but Rolfson and some very famous not theorists call it a diagram. So if you decide to Google these, this is the better term. So I, a diagram is a specific embedding. Okay, and then I have a, an equivalence class, which means anything that I can get to with an ambient isotopy or those three rules. So each, each uh, eight of these is a diagram, but they all belong to one class. And I just need to determine the class of one of these because they're all, it's an equivalence relation. So this one is called the unknot from the first slide. So therefore these all belong to the bracket of the unknot. Sometimes you, you use a U. Okay, I'm pulling up. Okay, so now here's some more technical things you may not have seen before. So there's something called the distortion of a knot. And notice that this doesn't have a bracket right now. So this is a diagram. So this is a specific embedding. So you're dealing with a closed curve, like a picture on a piece of paper. And I, the distortion, it looks complicated. I, I take the distance in the space. So this one we know. And I'm in the numerator, I have this new metric that I'm, I have the distance along, it's an embedded type of metric uh, that I have, I, cho I choose two points on the knot and then the length of the, of the arc that is the shorter of the two. So if I do two points on a closed curve, there's going to be sort of two paths that I can take from one to the other. And I, I take the shorter of the two. And I take now the supremum. So I'm trying to find what's the worst ratio of this. And that is called the distortion. So I have a nice picture for that. So this actually, you can just think probably what the first thing you came to your mind, or at least for me, was you know distorted like, you, like a picture. Like you try to have something in Photoshop and you distort it. And that's actually what it's trying to measure. So both of these embed a, an unknotted circle. And the one on the right seems to be more distorted. It looks like an ellipse. So the distortion of the one on the right is larger than the one on the left. These are for diagrams. Now this is a quick question, if you don't mind. Yeah. So is the metric on the knot the same? Is it even, uh, sorry, are you basically like parameterizing it like a like an like just a circle? Like a right? curve. Yeah, 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 yeah. The integral had a two or six hours a week so I can <laughs> yeah just you uh, you take the Euclidean length of that arc okay so you can turn this into invariant oh, can I also jump in really I don't know if you saw in the chat but people are saying that if you do full screen mode and use the arrow keys then you might not have to scroll I don't know if that makes it easier or not but <laughs> oh I actually that's a setting on my iPad that I can do here. I think this is going to be better now. Oh, okay, cool. Is that good? Yeah. Okay, let me have, I'll also, my, okay, yeah, my chat has gone away. So I will not be able to see a chat. Yeah, we'll, we'll monitor the chat for you. Okay, great. Okay, so you can turn this into an invariant for the class. And by, and how to do this is that you take the infimum over all diagrams that represent that class. So hopefully sink in for a second, you do a supremum and then you do an infimum and hopefully you think about it for a few seconds and you're like, wow, that's like impossible. I don't want to think about that because any, any little adjustment counts as a new thing that you have to run this, this argument for. So for example, here I select the P and the Q and then, okay, great. I have to do it for every pair of points. So obviously infinitely many. Uh, but if I make any slightest adjustment to that curve K1 or K2, I have to then do it all over again. So I'm going to check them all, and then that's what's called the distortion of knots. So because this is fairly nasty, uh, it wasn't studied too much, other than it's when it was initiated. So Gromov uh, was studying this and say, oh, what a cool idea. And I, I think that we're going to have to be greater than pi over two or so yeah so he showed actually it's greater than pi over two and it's pi over two when I, it's exactly this geometric circle so something that looks like the unit circle this k1 
Okay, and then someone showed, or a pair of people showed that if it's knotted, you have to be greater than five pi over three. And in fact, this is kind of the extent of the, well, so there's one more very famous one, but this was kind of the extent of what was shown for this for a long time. Uh, in fact, the, o the only knot class that has this distortion calculated is, this, is the end knot, which is Gromov result. So it, it, turns, it turned out to be a, you know, it, it still is, but it's a very hard problem. There's approximations that show that trefoil is probably five pi over three. Okay, and so he asked, is there any upper bound to this? So as knots get more complicated, let's say crossing, as they get more crossings, perhaps, do I bellow out? Like, can I not distort a diagram so far? I think that he said, like, can you get above 100? And Pardon showed that there, there is none. So if I take, so if you do know knot theory, this is probably like a very obvious place to start. These are called torus knots. But for now, let's just say they're knots and they depend on integers p and q. And as p and q get big, the distortion gets big. So this was, this was a very well received sort of annals of mathematics results. And it doesn't seem to be that deep. And it, it, it's, I would say it's deep for respect of how difficult this problem is, but there's just, there's not a lot you can hold on to is my point. So what, what I decided to do was, well, I probably don't have a good chance at solving something like that. So let's look at a simpler case. So these polygonal knots. So polygonal knots are something that's it's made up of sticks. And it's, it's hard to, in this time, to give a formal definition, but hopefully you can just see this picture. So they're piecewise linear, straight lines, and they form a knot. So the, the, a more specific type is a stick lattice knot. So you're allowed to go, if I'd like to give these an orientation, you're allowed to go you know, up and down, left and right, uh, but that's it. You must be confined to this, this lattice. So the, the formal, it's R cross C cross C business, but really you can go up, down, left, right, and you want to end on the, the lattice integers. So C to the three. Questions on this? I haven't breaks for a question. Maybe just a quick question on. So, yeah. I was just going to ask why, um, why do you need the factor of R in there as opposed to just having it on Z3 or something? So I, I'd like to be able to be a knot, so like a continuous curve, and that's what allows that. So if, if I choose, an, let's say, the origin, and I'd like a stick that goes just straight up, I will at some point have, you know, 0, 0, pi. So that's OK. I, I, like, I, need, I need two of them. As I'm moving, two of them have to be fixed integers. And then I end on another triple of integers. And my screen is doing that thing I talked about where it's not moving to the next one. So let me try to fix this. Okay, so these are studied. The big question in this field is, is how few sticks do I need? So it's a pretty cool question to ask if I'm, if I'm constrained to this piecewise linear, I'm not allowed to curve. If, I'm allowed, if I want to do just sticks, not stuck to the lattice, that's something else. But for us, how few sticks do I need in the lattice to create a certain type of knot? OK, and the step length is the, the length of this, of this arc. So that'll be an integer as well. And the vertex set is going to be just the, just the z3 points that are traversed. Okay, so here's a here's the picture of the trefoil. So the reason why I need that R is because while I'm traveling, I'm going to travel over some like not so nice, rational, irrational points. But that's okay as long as my endpoints are this Z three. So this is actually how few sticks you need. So the the stick invariant, the lattice stick number invariant of the trefoil is 12. 
you can't make it with fewer than 12. And you can't make the hop length with fewer than 16. So it's what you think. Like I have a square here and then a square here. So this is like two, 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 two. Horrible picture, but hopefully you see that. You know, kind of like how you normally would do a hop length. Um, but now they're squares. Oh, and I forgot I had a slide on there. Three, four is 12. Figure eight is 14. Uh, you're going to need more than 15 sticks in general. Cool problems. It's a, it's a fun thing to think about. Okay, but what I want from this is now to adapt that distortion to this field. So I'm going to call the vertex distortion the lattice. I'm going to, I'm going to do a very similar thing, except I'm not going to check all points. I'm going to just check the vertex points. So I'm going to just check these bold ones. So that goes from checking an infinite amount to a finite amount. So I can replace the supremum with the max. And uh, it turns out still very hard, but it's at least like obtainable opposed to the previous one. So likewise, you can turn this into an invariant if I just now take the infimum over all of them. So I'm going to try to find the worst case for a diagram and then the best case for all diagrams. That's what that means. I'm going to change the metric now to a, a little l1, so the taxi cab or Manhattan metric. So this is the metric of if I'm only allowed to go down the streets left and right. And I actually, I think I have a picture of that coming up. So for example, if I have a, two points here, I'm not going to measure this length. I'm going to measure just the, uh, I guess, to be more technical, kind of like the, the length of segments. I'm going to sum up the coefficients of the basis, or if I have like 1, 0, 0, 1. And you know, to get to this point, I need three of these and two of these. So the, the 5 is going to be my, my metric. OK. So the, this is what we showed. So for any confirmation of the knot in the cubic lattice, if you find out that the diagram you have has a dis distortion of one, then, then you know you're the unknot. Sounds obvious, but it's, it wasn't. But this is good. This means like the result and the idea that we're coming up with you know, mirrors the, the smooth case. And then also, we have the have like the foundation to to that to Pardon's result that there's there's no upper bound distortion. So we don't have it for a class of what we'll see as torus knots, but we have specific ones that are very special. So they look like this. They're of minimum or they're reduced and they have the fewest amount of sticks. So we're thinking that that probably means that the class itself should follow suit. So these are the main I, main theorems if you guys have questions on these. These pictures came from a, a Colin Adams paper. They put these in here and they said, hey, these are these are torus knots, but they didn't show how or why. So we did that and we showed, you know, the actually when it comes up, it'll make more sense. Questions? Okay, so like I said before, so these are the, these are the, okay, I think technically they're called staircase blocks. If you're a combinatorist. I called them, we called them taxi cab paths for a long time, but I think staircase walk is the, is the thing. So this is, this is going to be a, a key idea. So I want to show that if I, if I say I run the distortion and I figure out it's one, then the thing I have is the unknot. And I do want to go through the proof of this just because I think it shows kind of how fun this problem is. So from 0, 0 to 1, 1, there are two paths. And then you can kind of iterate these. And these are all the possible paths. And I will note the staircase walk, staircase path, is the most efficient way. If I'm restrained to this metric, and I like to go from one point to the another, I have Many options, unlike you know the the geodesic of a 
uh, the Euclid Euclidean metric, kind of like the straight line is going to give me the best way. There, there is more than one best way to get there. And I'll, I'll explain in the next one, but the, that's how you can check. So if your path has the same length as what a staircase walk has, then you are a staircase walk. Like you are the most efficient way to get from one to the other. Okay, so this is gonna be the, the slide to talk about. So let's see, so if I have a distortion of one, that means the the largest thing that I can get uh, is, is one. And if I choose any other points, I'm gonna be less than this because the distortion is gonna be the supremum. But I can't, I, I can never be less than one. Like I can't be closer along the knot than I am in the space. So this is also constrained below by one. So this tells me if I take any pair of points, the ratio I have is gonna be one with the, the length, the shortest length along the curve and the, the distance in space. Hopefully that makes sense. So I'm gonna pick a point here. I guess I'll just call this one P. A nice thing to, it's like a good little homework problem for a discrete math class is that these are all, all, all of these stick lattice knots are gonna be even length. And that has to do that if I, if I wanna be a closed loop and I, I go five meters out, uh, and I have to end where I started, I got to come five back at some point. So I'll be even. So what I can do is I can always choose its antipodal point. Okay, I'll say this is the antipodal point of this. Okay, but kind of like I talked about before, so the shorter of the two path lengths divided by the distance the L1 distance is going to have to be one. So that says that this, the green one, is a, oop, I'm going to not call it a taxi. This green one has to be a staircase. So it's like the most efficient way to do it. But this also says, now since this is an antipodal point, the other path is of equal length. So it actually says that this one must be a staircase as well. Okay, and then I want this idea. So let's say I had this knot. I've gotten pretty, well, that's a horrible drawing, but I've gotten pretty good at remembering how to draw these. So I want this idea of a minimum bounding box. So I have my, shrink a dink and I put it in the oven and I, so I have my shrink a dink and I put it in the oven. It's going to shrink around my knot, right? So it's going to, I'm going to end up getting, you know, a box that kind of just rests and it's going to, it's going to hit on the, on some corners here. So this is another idea. This is an idea of the bounding box, but a corner. So a corner is a corner if it, it's it's somehow a extrema point, meaning that for the x, the y, and the z, it's somehow either the smallest x value you can get, the largest x value you can get, the smallest y. So everything lives to one side of a corner. I guess side is not the right point, but one uh, octant. Okay, so in fact, so if I look at this P point, everything lives above and to the right. Everything lives above and to the right because we verified that both of these are staircase paths. And that's kind of like the idea of staircase path is that I never buckle over. I'm always the most efficient. So in fact, the point I picked, which was arbitrary, is a corner. 
So therefore, every point must be a corner. And then you just run through a few cases and you, you can see these are the only two you can get. <laughs> you know, this was hard because the pictures we kept drawing were not these two. So it was just a bunch of counter examples, not knowing it. But uh, this, we, we spent a while, we, so it does, if someone finds this interesting, you know, we, and we were looking for a way to talk about this. We originally tried to do Reitermeister move so that like you can do it. And what you do is you can, you get something that you can always unravel. That's the big idea here. But to avoid, so Reitermeister moves are defined for the smooth case. So we didn't really have it for the, this stick case. And they do, some people just assume that you can do it. But in, just to avoid that, we had this different, this different method. Okay, so this says that if I run this thing and I get a one out, then I have to be one of these two. So I am the n not. Any questions on this one? So I'm gonna to move to the next theorem. Okay, so the next idea I think is a lot more beautiful, but not as much generalization. So we're just trying to show that there's something, there is some collection of diagrams that get more and more distorted with our version of distortion. So I'm gonna spend a lot of time just kind of talking about what those knots are and how you construct them. I actually, I would hope that someone who's interested in combinatorics takes this because you can kind of get the idea now, distortion, this vertex distortion tells you uh, how, efficient your paths are. So if you have distortion one, you're like the most efficient. To get from one to the other, uh, you're gonna go as quickly as possible. But if your distortion is 100, that means there's gonna be a pair of points that you're gonna be close in space. So you, know, you live right next door to your neighbor, but you have to go all the way around. So I think for a graph theorist, this could be an interesting idea. Anyway. So we do want to construct knots. They're called torus knots. Uh, I guess I have enough time to just say, so a torus knot means that, so a torus is a donut. And the knots here are drawn on the surface of this donut. So they kind of spiral around, go around here, over, under. I count how many times in the long run do I go around the longitude and then how many times do I go around a meridian? So those are both terrible things. So longitude is like the long way around the donut and then go through the hole, that would be a meridian. And that's what the P and Q represent. And you can show that all torus knots look like this for relatively prime P and Q. We're gonna do P and P plus one. So those are obviously relatively prime, so they describe torus knots. Okay, so Colin Adams showed that the, the amount of sticks you need is gonna be greater than or equal to six times the P for P, P plus one. That actually has to do with the bridge index. So you have to be six more than the amount of bridges. If you do know the idea of bridges, this kind of makes sense for sticks because you would expect you do, at some point you go up, at some point you go left, at some point you need to go right then and forward. So you need to do all six, up, down, left, right, forward, back, okay. So I had this idea of how to tabulate these. If I was better at computer science, I think this would be a great uh, method to, to, to just compute these instantly. So I'm gonna say, I'm gonna orient these. Once again, I assume you guys probably understand this, but I'm gonna, so orient means that I have a closed curve and I have some arrows on it. So there's a path that I'm gonna follow, a way I'm gonna go around. So if I start somewhere, I'm gonna start at the origin. If I go up, I'm gonna say that there's a Z plus, and uh, you know, if I go X plus direction and so forth, that's what these mean. And so to describe this, uh, I just give links. I say, I'm gonna do a Z plus, an X plus, a Y plus. The Z plus is gonna be two P minus one length. And then I just, I give you all this data, data and you can, you can create one. So here's the chart of this and then you read this, 
So the first stick is a z plus, the first z length is a 2p minus 1. So it says I do a z plus, this is a 2p minus 1. Now I do an x plus, so I look for the first x, that's a 2. I go through here, and so forth. So I have 6p sticks, and I get something that looks like, oh, my screen. I'm sorry. Let me erase this. So I look at the type of stick I want. So the first one says that I do a Z plus in this sequence. And then I look at the first Z, which is the 2P minus one. And that tells me then the length, how far I do it. So you gotta check, is this a loop even? Do I get back to the point I started with? Do I self-intersect? And do I get the knot that I want? Do I actually get a torus knot? So if I do this, these took a long time, <laughs> but I get this very cool knot here. I actually gave this talk at a, an LGBT conference, so the rainbow fit in perfectly. I actually had this thing 3D printed which turned out to be really useful to calculate a bunch of things. In fact, now that we're looking at this one, I might say a few things about it. So if you look at any of these sticks, and if I tried to contract any of them, you, so you can't really tell because there's obviously space here, but in terms of the cubic lattice, I can't move any inward at all. So there's some, it's like as tight as it can be. And that's the idea. Uh, we didn't show the same result as pardon, but these look to be very special. Like these are as tight as you can be, as few sticks as possible. Very cool to play around with. Okay, so to show that these are the torus knot, uh, I made the torus that they live on. This took a long time learning how to do this in Mathematica. But you can count the p and the p plus one. So the long way around is I come around here. Boop, 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 I pop out up here. And here, here are the sticks that I wind up hitting to get the. Actually, so I hit p of them right here. Let me see if I can't do a finer. Okay, I hit a bunch of these. And then I, I come up at the top. And then, so that corresponds to coming out here, and then I get the p plus one by hitting this one. And then to count the meridian, so the whole of this goes through right here. Okay, here's another picture. This was the reduction I was talking about. So same idea, here's a different picture of it. I think it was easier to describe on that 3D print. This is kind of lame. You know, it's, it, it's gonna increase your distortion without really changing the geometry of the tangle. It's kind of like a cheap trick. That's what I coined it at first. So these are as tightly packed, reduced this way. This is another way of thinking of the reduction. If I bring a point in, it's going to drag these in and create a plane. I just don't want it to intersect as I go. I'm not going to talk about the proof of, of too much of this because I think it's it's just kind of boring unlike the other one but this is the big idea I'm going to think of these as all being pointed line segments that have some type of orientation and I'm gonna that's how I describe all of these so I'm going to do a lot of summing of arithmetic sequences I'm going to do a lot of arguments of this this coordinate never intersects with this coordinate uh, this is a picture from one of the proofs of them. So this maybe this gives you the idea of how you wanted to, you know, talk about these things.
and this is the path that so this is a path that it has a very high distortion so these these two red points are very close but to get to them i have to travel far far around the knot so these are the points that i selected each time and they are exactly the distortion of these diagrams for um, small knots and then once we i got up to like 20 20 plus one it took like five hours to parameterize and right around 10, it flips, like the points start being right here instead. So instead of, you know, trying to calculate this for all of them, I say, well, here's, it goes to infinity because, so the distortion is the greatest of them. And so it's gotta be greater than if I choose these each time and these each time go to infinity. So the distortion, which is gonna be worst, has to go to infinity as well. So I selected these two because it's right in the middle. So if you count these, I always tried to find the ones in the middle. Of course, there's some times where there's an even amount and you choose. I think I chose the larger one. Yeah, so here's the 22, 23. So hopefully you can appreciate that this may get a little cool picture though. Twenty-seven, twenty-eight. I had to leave my computer on overnight. Cool one. <laughs> oh, is someone talking? I see lips moving, but muted. Maybe. I was talking to someone else. Sorry. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so these are the conjecture. So this is the next step. So this paper was getting pretty hefty, so we cut it short. This one is a little different than what we showed. So these are the brackets. So we wanna show the same Gromov result, kind of that if you are the, uh, if you get a one for the whole class, then that whole class is the unknot. So we have one direction from the proof. Uh, same thing for the other one. So those, the stronger result is show that the class of TPP plus one goes to infinity as well both so this one we're very close in fact i think if we were just more clever it's right there this one i think you might need a new method you might need a little more machinery to do that both are fun both do not require a very hefty analytical topological if you an undergrad could do it that's i hope an undergrad decides to watch this one day this is where I started with the smooth distortion. So I created these plots. So this, this maybe can show you why the, the other way is a little more interesting. So I, half of this is redundant, but I choose, so I parameterize the, so I have my little knot, and I start here and I parameterize. So, you know, length one is right here. And I, I don't need to be integers. So maybe pi is right here. So I parameterize the length of this. And that, that corresponds to choosing one of these. So maybe I choose the point that's, let's do 60 along it. And then I choose the point that's 20 along it. And then I find where these intersect. And that gives me the distortion of the point at 20 along and 60 along. And this is where we started. Turned out to be a little too much that the computer can handle to calculate all the time. But very interesting, you always get something that looks like there's these peaks and valleys. It kind of looks like an egg crate. So you have these peaks and those valleys and these little dead zones, which means that you are very efficient in your path here and you're very inefficient when you choose these pairs. So there's like a very natural question is like, can I use this easier stick distortion to then describe the smooth distortion? I think yes. I think you know you could smooth the corners here and you could talk about it. You can there's probably something to be said. I wonder if you compare the points that I picked, maybe they always line up in a certain area here and there's a way to describe them. Okay. This was there was a master student 
that decided to do a project very similar to this. The original idea that I wanted to do is like an one of those plateau problems. So if you've seen that, where if I have a closed curve, like a knot, um, and it's fixed, it's rigid, it's not in topology anymore, what's the minimal area surface that that's the boundary of? So you try to find a, uh, you know, perhaps you picture you have this disk, you know, clearly the best area you can get is right here, but, you know, you might be concerned if you have a bubble that comes up. You know, clearly this wouldn't be the minimal area. So I wanted something to do with knots and, you know, how can you describe a minimal surface? So that's why I first said, well, why don't we make it rigid and make it a stick and then talk about it. And then we saw this distortion got distracted, but this is the same. This is similar to that. This is saying how, instead of how few sticks I need to create of the knot, how few tiles do I need to create a surface that the knot can live on? So how few squares do I need to make a torus? You know, the, the natural thing is I remove the one in here and I have a, a height of one. So it's, it's sim similar game to play. So she came up with some very nice things that do that. And that's the last slide I have. If there's any questions, I'd be more than happy to talk about something. I'm going to leave it on one of the nice pictures. Yeah, those those were some beautiful pictures. But uh, yeah, let's let's clap. For them. Anyone have any questions? So, so is distortion related to the bridge number of the knot? Uh, not directly. I the distortion. So the bridge index I mentioned here, it doesn't. It, it more has to do with the stick number, which kind of makes sense because if you think of like a bridge position, um, it, it seems like a. I guess when I a way that I've. I'm trying to find a blank spot here. The way that I've seen bridge, so some people define it kind of like a Morse function. So I have, so I'd like to, you know, as much as I can, I stick to this plane and then, you know, oh no, right here, I must come up from the plane to go here. And then I get a new bridge. Um, and then I get to stick on this plane. So that kind of makes sense that I, uh, the bridge in relates to the amount of sticks because there's no way I can avoid going up and then say left and then down. So that, you know, necessitates, oh, I must have at least, you know, three sticks additional now. Um, but nothing I know relates it to the distortion. There could be. Okay, thanks. I'm kind of, um kind of curious what goes into the computer calculations and like you're saying at some point you know you hit some sort of like ceiling where it's just like not computable anymore you know and I I, I think that ceiling might be my fault I think I I don't <laughs> I don't know if I know how to use Mathematica efficiently enough to where it doesn't time out because I'm so clumsy with it all what I did with these once again may not be the best way is I parameterized these. So I parameterized each segment by its arc length. So from here, you know, so for example here, like from here to here, you know, I have this big piecewise and I say, I give it a function and I, and I give it a parameter for that. And then, you know, I do, you know, potentially 200 of these and then it, it makes them all it gives me a whole set of points that I get to, you know, you can run through a calculator. But yeah, around 22, it starts taking a very long time. And the smooth way, I think, I would hope, I mean, maybe someone is, I know people are better at Mathematica than I am, but maybe someone is better enough to say, 
oh, this is an efficient way to describe the distortion because you, for small ones, like for the trefoil, I actually ran the smooth one through just a formula like, oh, take all pairs of points and divide by their distance. And it, it actually, it was okay, it could do that. But anything bigger than that, uh, I wasn't clever enough to program efficiently. So somehow in this computation, you really are having to do like all of these pairwise comparisons, is that? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I did have Mathematica to, you know, make sure I did it correctly, but in a sense, it was all kind of by hand, checking all pairs to make sure. And then once I got big enough, I just said, you know, I'm going to just check the ones where I think are going to get bigger. So like this pair right here. And then I just checked those. And then what I did is, is actually way easier by hand than by computer. But what you do is you pick this point. Um, so you have this table and you say, oh, that point is always 2p minus 6, say. And the other point is always, you know, 7. And then you, you have to be general, but you sum up these lengths. So you actually sum up a arithmetic sequence like you would in a pre-cal class, and you get a quadratic function that depends on p. So you can actually find a closed form for those pairs of points that I picked. Not a groundbreaking result, but a very cool one. And I think it leads the way to say that, hey, this is a useful thing to study. It follows what your intuition says, so it's worth your time.